This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Luke Silvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. By fans, for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is April 23rd, 2024. Jonathan Osborne here. As always, joined by my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, the Magic are down 2-0 to the Cleveland Cavaliers with another loss uh, earlier tonight. This time, 96-86 to in Cleveland. Pretty similar to Game 1. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are... <laughs> my thoughts are that uh, you just got back from Orlando. It is actually april 23rd it is 12 10 a.m i transparently woke up uh, about five minutes ago because i took a little nap and you had to call me because you you almost didn't have me for this episode of being i'm aware and you called me and and i woke up uh my alarm happened and i don't even remember going off so i'm here the magic are down 2-0 and it just felt like game one, like aside from an injury scare, it's it felt like game one. So that, that's that's where I'm at. I mean, there's there's really nothing else to say right now. Yeah, um, I, I'm honestly I'm still optimistic. Not in the I I don't want to say like I feel optimistic that we're going to win the series. Like I'm still optimistic that we can win the series. Obviously when you're down two Oh and the offense has just been as bad as ours has been, it's hard to be like, Oh yeah, no, like everything's going to turn around. I think for me, what it is is like, we just need to get this team home and we need to get this team in front of magic fans and the Orlando crowd, just teams like historically, especially role player role players. They just, play better at home in the playoffs and teams tend to shoot better at home. And the Magic are, are desperately you know, going to need that here. But through two games now in the playoffs, the Magic are shooting 34% from the floor. They're shooting 23% from behind the arc and they're shooting 67.9% from the free throw line. The offense, I know that we had our concerns, but I don't think even the most pessimistic Magic fans could have envisioned just how bad the offense has been the first couple of games. Now, the defense, thank goodness, has traveled and has translated from the regular season to the postseason. Magic hold the Cavaliers under 100 points again. We knew that this Cleveland Cavaliers team was not an offensive juggernaut by any means. But the fact that, you know, this year when the Magic have held opponents to under 100 points, they've been really successful. You've been able to do that the first couple of games. You just haven't been able to get the offense. Yes, the, these guys are going to shoot better in front of the home crowd. Is that going to help them just like bust out of this slump? So best case scenario, you have two games in Orlando. You shoot the cover off the ball, tie the series. You're going back to Cleveland. Is that going to be able to travel? Are, are guys going to be able to carry confidence over from you know, games in Orlando to to games in Cleveland, it's, it's bleak right now. You know, it it feels, I I don't want to say hopeless because how many, like we we've seen teams go up 2-0 before we saw the Phoenix Suns a few years ago in the the finals, for goodness sake, go up 2-0 and then the the Bucks rattle off four in a row and they win the title. So we've seen teams come back from 2-0 plenty of times. Um, but yeah, this team is just like really searching for for offense really quickly. But for uh, real quick, before we get too far into the the weeds here on this game, I just want to give uh, a shout out. First two games, you know, these uh, watch parties that we had at Wall Street have been awesome. Even though the results haven't gone the way that we wanted, and you know, the Magic have found themselves down by twenty plus in in both of these games. When the Magic have even put a, a few shots together, like even gone on a small run, like this city is, is is hanging on every shot and is reacting when these guys are are making plays. So I, I I'm really confident that that's going to translate into Thursday when this team is playing in front of its 
home crowd. But shout out to everybody that's been at the watch party. If you've been at either of those, you've been at both of those. The energy has been great and really excited to see what that looks like uh, Thursday in, in front of the home crowd. But I guess let's talk about this game in, in some, some detail here. So I felt like the magic got off to a good start, you know, Cleveland, you know, again, it's a, it's a, this time it was a Donovan Mitchell three that started the game. And then the magic can't make shots. Cleveland hits another three and you're like, Oh my gosh, is this really about to happen again? But the magic were able to hold their own, you know, throughout that first quarter, really where the game felt like it turned Luke was right around the four minute mark where uh, Jalen Suggs collides with Donovan Mitchell's knee and he hyperextends his left knee. Jalen Suggs goes to the ground, can't get up on his own power, literally has to be carried off the floor into the locker room. And you felt the life just get sucked out of this Magic team. And pretty much immediately, the Cavs went on like a 14-5 to run to blow this game open. And the Magic really never got it super close, you know, until the, the fourth quarter. Magic made a little bit of a run there. But a lot like the first game, Cleveland gets out to a, a good start in that first quarter and just is able to hold the Magic at arm's length the rest of the way. Now, everybody was thinking the worst when Jalen Suggs goes down. Are we not going to have him the rest of this game, this series? Are we going to get him back at the beginning of next season even? So on and so forth. I was just holding on the hope that we would get some good news with Jalen. I didn't want to jump to any conclusions. But seeing that dude warm up to start the second half was just like a huge shot in the arm, at least for me and, and the crowd that we had at Wall Street. And I was hoping that his teammates seeing him out there would be like this big like emotional lift. And it felt like it was a little bit. But again, when you're just not able to make shots and, and really help the momentum continue to carry and get yourself all the way back in this game, it, it just comes down. Paolo Bancaro, after this game, said... It's the name of the game. You got to make shots. And Magic haven't been able to do that through two games so far, Luke. Another thing Jamal Mosley said was he admitted Jalen Suggs goes out and he said, essentially, it's it, it was hard for the guys to see the head of the snake defensively go out of the game and not know. And that kind of hanging in the balance of is he good? Is he not? Are we going to even see him again in this series? Like the players having the same internal dialogue that we're having, right? While we're watching the game. So they're trying to process that. They're trying to stay in this game. And then all, like you said, Jalen Suggs goes out and then Cleveland is able really to just go on their run. In that and, moment, it literally felt like the series was over. Yeah. And, and, and for some people, we're at that point. Right where we're in, I'm not going to name any names myself. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you just said we. So and 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 that's really like that for me. It was like okay, we, maybe it's not going to be a replay game one. So it goes down. They go on that run, and it just even with sucks coming back, like you said, it might have provided a little bit of of a spark for the team, but the damage had already happened. And you already were down double digits going into the half, going into the half against a team that like all of a sudden you think that it's a one time thing that this team shoots, you know, sub 35% from the field and you look up and you're doing it again. And that's got to take a mental toll on these guys. Obviously it has. You got guys that you've been all year depending on guys like I talked about in the last pod to hit open shots, and they're still not doing it. And the part that irritates me the most is that, yes, Franz Wagner goes 5 of 17 tonight, but he goes 2 of 4 from 3. Similar number last game in game 1. And it's like, okay, we finally got Franz Wagner back from the perimeter. And then our other guys are like, well... That stinks because we're not going to hit any shots. <laughs> so it's just it's just a whole like just balancing act in a back in a back and forth, and it sucks. There there's no other way to say it. And and like you said, Paolo, alluding to like this is the name of the game. We got to knock these shots down, and that at times feels like that's all there is. Make shots, 
and you put up more of a fight. You only lose this game by 10. And you shot 36% because, again, your defense held strong and the Cavs shot 41.5%. Like, they didn't light the world on fire. And it truly was just that Jalen Suggs, when he goes out with that injury, it truly was just that run that won them this game. Because for the most part, from there on out, the Magic held their own. You lose the third quarter by one, you win the fourth quarter by five. You have, obviously, this is, there's not ever been a more obvious must win in the history of basketball. You have to win this game on, on Thursday. To give yourselves a chance, you've got to win games three and four. They go back home and somehow steal one in Cleveland. So we'll, yeah. we'll see what they have in them. Yeah. Can't go down 3 0. Paolo talked after the game just about how they are going to need that crowd on Thursday to lift them up the way that the Cleveland, because mm-hmm. the Cleveland crowds have been incredible first two games. Like it, it's been a great atmosphere, both of these games. And uh, the guys are going to need Kia to be that type of environment on Thursday to lift them up and to, to give them confidence and, and will. Uh, them to to make shots because right now they're not doing it. I'm looking at their totals over the course of the first couple of games here. The only two guys on the roster that are shooting over 38% from the floor are Paolo Bancaro and Mo Wagner. Paolo Bancaro is 18 of 37, 48.6% from the floor. Mo Wagner is 56.3% from the floor. And right now, nobody would have bet this. The only guy on the roster shooting over 35% from three is Franz Wagner, who's 40% from three in this series. Four of 10 from behind the arc. Jalen Suggs is one of 10. Gary Harris is four of 12. He had a bounce back uh, performance tonight. We'll talk about that. Uh, J.I.'s three of 11. Wendell, two of eight. Cole, 0 of five. Joe, 0 of two. I I just, as bad as the offense has been, never in my wildest dreams did I expect that it could be as bad as it has been which is the thing that gives me hope moving forward cuz yes i i would bet almost anything that guys are going to shoot better in front of the the Kia Center crowds on Thursday and on Saturday and then even if you can take a little bit of that with you yeah. back to Cleveland if you're not shooting 36% from the floor and 25% from behind the arc even if you're low 40s in this game from the floor and low 30s from behind the arc, you have a real chance to win it, win this game. Magic go on a big run. They were down, I think, as much as 22 at the beginning of the towards the beginning of the fourth quarter, and they go on this big run that's capped off by that Jalen Suggs and one on that play with the Coro in Mo Wagner, where Mo Wagner sort of falls into the crowd. Uh, looks like a a fan got hurt. Unfortunately, hope he's okay. But Jalen Suggs goes the other way, has the N1, cuts the lead to nine. And then it's sort of like, I think it was like two straight possessions of Donovan Mitchell at that point, just like getting to the basket. And and at that point, I Carmen was 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 with me at, at Wall Street. I said, like, the, the, the lead went back to 13. And I said, this game is, is just over. You know, four minutes to go, you're down by 13. You haven't been able to muster up any type of offense through two games in Cleveland so far. And that's the thing that really sucks right now is, Throughout the regular season, when this team got down, you know, 15 points, even if it was the third, fourth quarter, you felt like they had a run in them. And the way that they're shooting the ball right now, you just don't really have that confidence that they're going to be able to make a sustained run. You talk about role players shooting better at home. We've seen that play out in another series already. And I'm talking about the Knicks and the Sixers. The Knicks are up 2-0 in their series, and Jalen Brunson, this is not misspeaking, Jalen Brunson has shot 16 for 55, 29% in two games, and the Knicks have won both, and it is legitimately all at the hands of their role players. Josh Hart has given back-to-back, I believe, 21-point games. Dante DiVincenzo, 4 of 8 from 3. Josh Hart, 4 of 7 from 3. And that's really all it has taken from 3 for the Knicks to to have these these wins. 
They win by three tonight. They were down by five, by the way, just on a side note, down by five with 30 seconds to go, and they won this game by three. Uh, Dante DiVincenzo, role player, hits a huge three to essentially win them, put them in the position to put them up one and win this game. So, yes, role players should shoot better at home. At this point, I'm just hoping the confidence isn't so shot that it just doesn't matter that we don't get it back, the confidence and the ability to shoot the ball. But, yes, uh, if you can go back home, get your confidence back, and bring some of that with you, like you said, to Cleveland, then you could have yourself a series. But you're going to have to light it up. There's no way around it. You're going to have to light it up. And that's what it's going to take. And hopefully these guys seeing the ball go through the hoop will be enough to carry them through the rest of the series. All right, let's go ahead and take a quick break. Just give a special shout out to our patrons. If you're new to the show, new to our content, uh, our Patreon, uh, they help uh, really support the show financially, help us do everything that we do here. Uh, we legitimately could not do anything without them. Shout out to our, our guy, Bill Fulton. Saw him tonight at the watch party. I was able to talk to him for a little bit, uh, and he gave me a uh, one of the replica Shaq jerseys from the Shaq jersey retirement night. Uh, so we'll be giving uh, that away probably sometime during the, the off season once everything's had a chance to, to calm down. But a big shout out to our buddy Bill. Uh, we give a special shout out to all of our Hall of Fame and elite tier patrons each and every episode. So let me go ahead and start by shouting out our friends over at Court Cousins. Then our buddy Drew Gooden, Armin, Carson, Tulo Ellis, Jonathan Borges, Normal, Magic Player History, Gabe Gaines, Wiffle, Michael Martin, Jamel Miller, Michael Salapong, Donkey Punch Day, Paolo and Francis Warren, Pierre A, Dylan Holden, Mr. Mikey, Danimal, Bobby Skinner, Godi93, Teddy Sylvia, Eric Lopez, Fuchsia, Bill Folden, Edmund Lagone, Jose Esquilin, Caleb Pete, Cannibalism, Ty, Mr. TV, ESPN Really Sucks, Gear 95, Shred, Junior Bruce, Half Freak, and Shahan 177, Bobby the Don, Himlo Ben, Himro, Arm Prof 221, Ray Pastrana, Magic Kid 714, Mysterious Mosley, Victor Cologne, Irish Magic Mike, Austin Lampy, Random Hustle, Only Franz, Maria, Keith Walsh, Fritz, Currency Kev, Bro, Sal, Case and Green, Santi Leon, Kane Neckler, The Distract, Ahmad Timsa, Chansu, Tom Gadsden, Dead Air, Richard Tuttle, Jeremiah Cantero, Magic Wired, Debo 1980, Magic Matt, Michael Thompson, Mama Richmond, Next Napa, What's Up Playoffs 2024, Dylan Face, Sammy, David, Smiths, Bueno Times, and Stantino 1995. A big shout out to all of our patrons. Uh, if you want to help support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. And the show is also helped and, and partnered with, brought to you by our folks over at Jam Hot Chicken. 400 West New England Avenue, Suite 13 in Hannibal Square, and beautiful Winter Park it is a Nashville and LA-inspired hot chicken shack that is locally owned and operated at that address in Winter Park. As I said, you guys can check them out, jamhotchickenfl.com. Look at their menu, online ordering, music playlists, all things Jam Hot. And you can also find them on social media, one of the best social media in the game, at Jam Hot Chicken. Go try them out. Let them know the six-man show sent you. All right, Luke, what what do you think is is going wrong? Obviously, like we can talk about the shooting, we can talk about the offense. To me, all of the offensive issues lie with the shooting. You know, the way that these teams, well, this team in particular, you know, Cleveland uh, is guarding Paolo and guarding Franz. And let me just say this: this would be the strategy no matter what team we're playing, right? Cleveland can execute it to almost perfection because they have two elite rim protectors in Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, to which even if the rest of their you know defense isn't absolutely perfect, those guys just cover up for so many mistakes. But any team that we would have played, this would have been the strategy to pack mm-hmm. the paint and to live with open threes and and dare t- the 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 guys on this Magic team to knock down those shots. Right? The shooting is an issue. We know that, right? Besides the shooting, what other areas are concerning you the most and do you think are the biggest issues through two games in this series? The, when the Magic make a run, it feels like either Donovan Mitchell gives them the lift that they need or it's Jarrett Allen and Evan Mobley getting an easy bucket at the rim. And so for me, that is the biggest thing is like when you're throwing a punch, Cleveland 
always has a counter right now. And those easy buckets at the rim are killing you. Jared Allen, Evan Mobley, it really, uh, they're both basically averaging 16 points a game through two because that's what they've scored basically in both games. But you see it like, and you you have talked about it as well, and it's something that we've noticed is like Jonathan Isaac is having to help so much on virtually every possession when there is any pressure at the rim, leaving Jarrett Allen wide open because Jonathan Isaac is just trying to make a play on the ball because his the guard in front of him couldn't get a stop. That's been really frustrating because it just seems like free buckets for Cleveland because their guards are so good. They can get past you whenever they want. And that's part of what makes Cleveland that dangerous. That's why Mobley and, and Jared Allen each average about 16 points a game in the regular season too. This is the name of their game. Evan Mobley is going to hit shots. And if he does, you live with it. I don't mind how you've kind of let him shoot whatever he wants from the perimeter, to be honest. He shoots one of four in the game tonight from three. So you live with that. But at the rim, you're getting you're getting killed on really pivotal possessions. And it's not like it's all game. But it just seems like when you need it to happen the least, Cleveland only scored 36 points in the paint tonight. They didn't necessarily beat you in the paint, but those were back-breaking plays when they just get free looks at the rim. So for me, it's defensively, it's that. I don't know what the answer is, if I'm being honest. Is it, do you start Dell at the five and J.I. at the four? I, I just want let, to, let's go right there because I uh, there's a lot of people talking about that. I just don't think, like, without effectively stopping these guys at the point of attack because like Gary and Jalen are doing a great job. They, they, they really, really are, but like they are targeting Paolo in the pick and roll, whether it's with Darius Garland or whether it's with Donovan Mitchell and like Paolo just has not been able to stay in front of these guys. It's much worse, obviously when we break the lineup and it becomes Cole Anthony and Markel Fultz and Joe Ingles. Like at that point, it's just like a feeding frenzy. I don't think that going to Wendell fixes all of this. Jonathan Isaac is one of the best defenders in the world. It's not Jonathan Isaac's defense is, that's the issue. Is He's having to, to help so much and cover up so much ground to try to contest these guys in the paint or at the rim. Then it's just Evan Mobley and Jared Allen are cutting behind him right in front of the basket, and it's an easy dunk. People, Nikola Vucevic, right? by no means is like an elite defender. But people used to get on Vooch all the time because teams would just feast at the rim. Well, you had DJ Augustine, you had Evan Fournier as his front line of defense, and those guys were Swiss cheese defensively. When you put a big in that like situation, I don't care who it is, the other team is just going to feast. So I, I, I don't know what the answer is. Like Cole, Markell, they're not giving you anything offensively. They're almost worse defensively, as as bad as they've been offensively. Kevin talked about this a lot in the post game live. I don't understand how you you don't give Anthony Black a shot. Like defense all around has to be better. Like it hasn't been terrible, mind you. You know you've held this team to under a hundred points both games, but if the offense is going to be this bad, the defense has to be absolutely perfect, and you cannot have those lapses. So I don't know what the answer is unless you're going to give Anthony Black a try. Like we, we threw Caleb Houston out there tonight to try to give these guys some spacing. If, we're, whether, if we're, we're willing to throw Caleb Houston out there just for the sake of trying something new, I don't understand how Anthony Black doesn't get a shot. I mean, and let's be clear. We're only having this conversation because the most obvious thing that needs to happen is that you do knock down shots. <laughs> the you hold the Cavs under 100. They shoot 41.5% from the field. It is ultimately just going to be hitting your shots. And to that point, at what point do you say, hey, Cole Anthony hasn't been giving us anything? 
He he has been awful. I, I think, and he can't do any. We talked about it. Effort wise, he he tries on defense. I just think it, this is such a bad matchup for him. Like it's the terrible. size that Cleveland is playing, like it, it's it's not like Markell. I feel like is unplayable in the playoffs. That's where I'm at. Mosley Cole, has showed you that much. Yes. Well, in the two out of our last three games, like the three biggest games of the year, Markell has not played a single second in the second half. Right. I don't know why he was thrown out there in the second half on Saturday. In the moment, it was like, no, this is a mistake. But. Milwaukee, both Cleveland games, two out of those last three games, you have not been able to play Markel in the second half because you know he's unplayable. Why are we going to continue to do this? Like Cole, I feel like in a different series could be impactful. When he's hitting his when, shots. <laughs> when he's hitting his shots, yes. But if he's being targeted by Mobley right. and Jared Allen, he's just he has no shot. None. He he's not in a situation to succeed, and like I said, it, it is it is not due to effort. It is solely just because laterally he's not quick enough to keep up with these shifty guards, and 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 if he's not hitting shots, then there's really no point in having him on the court. Aside from like, you look behind him and you're like, oh, we don't. If Moses like, we don't have anybody else. It's like, oh, you do. His name's Anthony Black, and at this point, I just want Anthony Black to get playoff run. I want him to get in there and, and make mistakes, learn from them, so that I, we don't have to see him next year in the postseason make the mistakes he could just make this series and be better for it next year. And you're not losing anything. You're gaining some defense, obviously. If you can just plug and play him in that second game. Jamal unit, Murray just hit a game winner against the Lakers that's as wild. we speak. And so yeah, for Anthony I would Bla- I would literally I would kill somebody <laughs> to put Jamal Murray on this team. Wow. Somebody bad, somebody evil, <laughs> somebody that's done a lot of wrong in their life, that's hurt a lot of people. If nobody ever was gonna know about it, I would I would I'm I would think about uh, that you, you said to get well. your I'm I'm kidding, <laughs> but I would do really bad things <laughs> short of hurting somebody else. Yeah, to get Jamal Murray on this. Jamal team. Murray is nasty. Um, Jamal, on your day off, uh, you got you got a moment to come over to Orlando. We'll give you right back to Denver. Yeah. We just need to borrow you. I don't care that. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. But anyway, back to Anthony Black. Yeah, I, I don't see a reason why he shouldn't get run. Just give him a look. It can't get any worse. Than what we've seen from guards in that in that second unit, and yeah, it's just crazy to me. I I really think that like it's a it, this is a matchup thing for Coley. Like, I think in like an against another team or like if the Magic somehow make it to the second round, we could be like okay, this is a series where Cole might be able to have a little bit more of an impact. But against Cleveland specifically, it's I just feel like it's a bad matchup for Cole Markell. I, I don't care what all team in matchup. the field, you know, in, in terms of these playoffs, who it is, he, he's he's just unplayable. He he just really is. Here, here's the other thing too. So Markel Fultz, we can table that because you and I both agree. We don't have to continue to every, to beat that dead horse. Every, everyone should should probably be being in agreement on that end because Jamal Mosley has shown us what what an, a professional coaching staff thinks. Now. When it comes to Cole Anthony, though, you're going into game three at home, and we've already said your role players shoot better at home. I think you've got to give him one more go uh, before you throw Anthony Black in there because what he can provide offensively if he is hot is incredible and very much can swing the series. Cole Anthony... 16 plus point performance could win this team a game because Paolo has already shown you that he's going to get his in the playoffs evidently. He, I have been blown away from how he has finished these games efficiency wise. Don't get me wrong. There's points where he settles and, and I'm frustrated with him but I already expected him to shoot like honestly, like a Jalen Brunson 
numbers in the first two games of the playoffs. That's what I would have and did really expect to happen and not really any fault of his own. I just knew it'd be difficult. So once again, shout out to him because he has been awesome. The turnovers have have not been awesome. Those have not been awesome, but it is still way better than what I thought we were going to get productivity wise from him. And I'm, and I'm, I don't mean to just like, you know, give him like a complete pass, but when like he can't even take more than two dribbles without having two or three guys that are swiping at the basketball because they don't respect your teammates enough and they're just willing to give them any wide open look. It I, I just I genuinely don't know what he's supposed to do there. The thing that he does need to stop is leaving his feet yes. without like a real clear mm-hmm. decision of what he's about to do. Cause he'll leave his feet and then just sort of look around and then so that he doesn't travel, he'll just try to fire a pass to somebody. And it's like you can flip a coin whether or not that's gonna be a turnover. And and that's happened, you know, three or four times in this series alone already. And I could have no idea what I'm talking about here when it comes to Paolo and his experience at all, you know, the levels prior to this, to the NBA. My guess, you and I have said this, obviously, but it's something we've talked about. I don't remember if we've really talked about it much on an episode about Paolo leaving his feet and making a pass. That's like the cardinal rule you don't break. And like you hear, start hearing that in like middle school when you start thinking that you're cool and that you're flashy and whatever, like that's when you start kind of getting your, your basketball swagger. You think that you can do everything on the court. Your coach is quickly going to humble you and be like, Hey, you can't leave your feet and, and pass the ball. If you leave your feet, it needs to be because you're shooting is essentially what that's going to boil down to or going for a rebound. And my guess is that Paolo Bancaro is such an athlete and has dominated at every level that he's been able to fire those passes and the defenses don't react fast enough, whatever it might be. I I wonder if this is maybe his first time experiencing playing against defenses that are able to cover the ground to make him look silly for leaving his feet and passing the basketball. This might be the first level where he's not been able to get away with it. Uh, it's it's been two seasons of this. Like I don't, I don't want. I'm not here to like pile on Paolo Bencaro. I think he's been like relatively very good, right? Um, obviously, you know the offense hasn't been good enough as a whole, but like I've seen two years of like, hey, like we we got to stop turning the ball over. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm just saying it to this point because he has never really had to change it it's a habit yeah it's a this is my game and it's a terrible part and and those passes like are are going to be the biggest things i think for him this offseason yeah he he's obviously made strides he's a freaking all-star but he's not a perfect player yet that's for sure and yeah I, i would i would venture to say like he already showed us that he could improve his three point shot He's done that from year one to year two. And now it's time in the off season to continue to tighten the handle and be a little bit smarter when it comes to his passing. Because if he can take care of the turnover issue, he is going to open up the world where he averages eight and a half plus assists a game. That's the player that Paolo Bancaro can be. That's the player we know he will be. But right now, you're just having to grow through the, the the pain there. And it is what it is. But largely, from Paolo, he is the furthest thing from the problem, in my opinion. Yes, the turnovers suck, but at least he is knocking down shots. And that's more than 90% of this team can say, 95%. Another, you know, sort of part of the issue has been the rebounding, you know, like offensive rebounds were a problem in, in game one to a certain extent tonight game two at certain times, they just felt like a backbreaker 15 offensive rebounds for Cleveland in this one. And I, I feel like the issue is connected to the point of attack defense in a certain way. When the bigs are being pulled away from the basket, it's hard to, you know, stop Jared Allen and Evan Mobley from just diving to the rim. It also makes it hard for those guys to get back and, and box out and, and, def- and uh, you know, rebound in an effective manner. So I, I just, 
I don't know what the answer is. I do feel like Gary and, and, and uh, Jalen Suggs have been doing a good job. I don't know if there's an adjustment that can be made to the, the pick and roll defense. So uh, maybe we're not switching everything and, and getting those mismatches. Maybe, you know, dare uh, Donovan Mitchell and, and Darius Garland to, to knock down those threes a bit more. I mean, tonight Darius Garland was 4-7. I feel like he was awesome. Uh, especially in the second half, Magic were trying to make that run. Donovan Mitchell was two of ten from behind the arc. I I, I don't know what the answer is, it, but I know an adjustment needs to be made in in a few areas for sure, because uh, that killed you tonight. Like Jared Allen had sixteen and eighteen in game one, had sixteen and twenty tonight. Like he is just completely feasting. Something that needs to be done. I don't know if it is, you know. I don't think the answer is putting Wendell into the starting lineup over J.I. I think there's a possibility that the answer might be starting Wendell next to J.I. And although it's going to hurt the offense a little bit, Gary Harris going to the bench, I don't think you're going to bench Jalen Suggs in that scenario. But I feel like maybe matching their size, like matching that like double big lineup might be the answer. I, I just don't think swapping out Wendell for J.I. is going to help with the the rebounding mm-hmm. and is going to necessarily help with... Because like Wendell has not been a great rebounder this year. Like uh, Wendell played a minute less than J.I. and had one more rebound. I don't, I don't think he's going to have this massive impact rebounding the ball or you know defensively. But I do think potentially playing those guys next to one another uh, could help. Who knows? But uh, let's talk a little bit about Franz tonight. 18 points, seven rebounds, two assists, a steal, a block, six turnovers as well. Was 5 of 17. He was really solid in the first half. He was 5 of 11 from the floor in the first half. He was 0 of 6 from the floor in the second half. Had a little uh, scuffle with a fan, got a a fan kicked out late in this game. (laughs) You've got to be a pretty big scumbag. You've got to say something pretty crazy for Franz Wagner to step to you the way that he did. We've never seen him do that with any fan, you know, throughout his first three years in the league. And that fan got kicked out of the game. Um, I, I again, like Franz, sure. He could have been better in that second half, but I just, I'm not one of those guys. It's like, Oh, Franz Wagner and Palo bank care are the issues with what is happening to me. It's by far and away, like what we're not getting from the guards, like Joe Ingles, Markel Fultz, Cole Anthony, Jalen Suggs to a certain extent. Like I give Jalen a bit of a pass tonight because he obviously wasn't 100% in that second half. But when he's got open shots, like we need Jalen to knock down open threes. That That's going to do so much for Paolo, for Franz, for that starting lineup and for this team as a whole. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm not giving him a pass just because game one, Without an injury scare, dude was having a brick off with the core of Cavaliers. 16. I think he was it, like one of seven from behind the arc. Yeah, it it wasn't it wasn't good by any any metric. And yeah, I, I it's it's so frustrating, and because another thing too, aside from rotation and giving players shots, with like it's it's easy to be from our position and be like, oh, just put put. Put Anthony Black in. Just put him in over Cole Anthony, whoever you have to. But at the same time, you know there's got to be a voice in Jamal's head that is saying, and probably the reason why it's not happened, because he's of the mindset of like, yeah, but what if he's, what if, what if the next shot is the next shot that gets him going and it can win us, win us the game? I get that, and and I think that you do have to give him a chance at home to get things going. It's a crappy situation to be in, but to your point, yeah, you, you can't put this on Palo and Franz because if you just hit your open shots and, and the data, the stats show, and I, I don't remember if it was Philip Ross and Reich um, over Atlanta Magic Daily or who it was, but they did kind of like a deep dive on the closest defender in game one and basically the the magic not basically the magic generated more quote-unquote open looks than than cleveland did they just legit they just weren't knocking them down and 
from a coaching standpoint, people can yell at Jamal Mosley about, you know, whatever this player should be in over this player. But the one thing you can't say is that he's not trying every action, every look that he can get these guys an open shot just to see if he can get them to get hit something. And our guy, Fazan Amer, who knows way more about the X's and O's of basketball than I ever will, was someone tonight that was saying to us in our you know six man show all hands, Jamal Mosley is trying everything. This is not on Jamal Mosley. He he is coaching his butt off when it comes to the the schematics of it and in the actions that they're running. So just it's so stupid, but the analysis is the same as it was in game one. Make your open shots and you win these games. Because your defense is there. And while there are some things that like it's it's crazy that we're even having to discuss defense, but but it, it's there. And the only reason you're we're discussing defense even more is because it's like, well, what if the shooting doesn't come around? You need to get up, catch up to them at some somehow in the point column. And we just think that defense gives you the best option, but but it ultimately comes down just hit a few more shots, man. Yeah, that's um, all we're asking. Right. I'm looking on uh, NBA.com at their shot dashboard uh, closest defender data. Uh, they don't have the uh, numbers up for game two yet, but in game one, in shots that are like the closest defender distance range is open, which is uh, the closest defender was anywhere from four to six feet away from you, and wide open shots, which is six plus feet away from you, the Magic were 10 of 46. Um, on open and wide open looks, and that includes two and three point field goals. So, like you're getting the looks, you just have to make shots. That Paolo Bancaro again said that after the game, you just got to make shots. That's the name of the game. And if if the Magic aren't able to do that, and you know they're not able to, if, if the Magic aren't going to make shots. Everything else has to be perfect. Like you can't allow second chance opportunities. You can't allow offensive rebounds, and the defense just has to be perfect. You can't afford to have these, you know, lapses where you're going underneath Darius Garland like twice in a row and giving him wide open threes. I don't expect the defense to be absolutely perfect because, like, you know, it's 48 minutes of basketball. Mistakes are going to happen. So yeah, if you don't knock down shots, you're not going to have a chance. Luke, uh, the line is already opened for this game on Thursday. The Magic are favored by a point and a half at home. Mm -hmm. So even Vegas doesn't believe that the Magic are going to continue to shoot the ball the way that they have in these first couple of games, at least not at home, which is, you know, it's encouraging. If the Magic are able to win game three, carry that momentum in a game four, we're going to go into Tuesday game five. If there is a game five feeling a lot better than we do now, but you're going to go into that just sort of a little bit weary of how the magic are going to be able to shoot. If they do end up going back to Cleveland. Yeah. Take game three. You still have a shot. You don't win game three. Then that the series is effectively over. Unfortunately, but we don't we get know, swept. Do not know, get swept. Yeah. Don't get swept. Do not get swept. And, uh, Everybody's got to show up on Thursday. Game three. Biggest biggest game in a long time. So hopefully yeah. everyone shows out and, and makes them feel the love. Yeah, Paolo, after the game, uh, basically said, like, we're going to need the fans to, to give us the lift that you know Cleveland got. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to be at that game, you got to leave it all in the stands. You, you Do not leave with your voice. We, we need to cheer louder. We need to bring the energy from the opening tip. We need to lift those guys and will them to win that game. If you're going to be in the area, uh, but you don't have a ticket to the game, outside of Kia, there is going to be a fan fest. I believe I, I heard somewhere that that's a ticketed event that you need to, it's a free ticket, but you need to sign up for the ticket somewhere. I'm trying to Probably pull up OrlandoMagic.com or yeah, it might be somewhere in the app as well. Let me go in. I'm going to take a quick look at watch parties. No, you can get tickets. Um, uh, no, I, I'm going to have to look yeah. this up and, and uh, post it somewhere on our uh, social media. But okay, you can download a ticket. 
uh, NBA.com slash magic slash playoffs. Hashtag watch parties. Let me see if I can get this to load. Yeah, we'll we'll have to tweet this out. There are, are you can get tickets to the fan fest. They are free, but it is a ticketed event, so you'll need that to get in. So let me bookmark this. I'll I'll make sure to post that to our social media pages. And important programming announcement, Jonathan. Following that game, game three on Thursday, we will doing a bit of a hybrid live show with old producer Kevin. We'll be going live likely 30 minutes-ish after the game. And it will serve, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty certain here, it will serve as the episode that we put out that basically as soon as we can. It'll serve as that episode. So you won't get this type of me and Jonathan episode the next day, but there will be showing up on your feeds. If you don't tune in live on Thursday night after the game, you will have us there with audio and on YouTube, you can go back and watch. So wanted to give that note as well. Yeah. All right, Luke, I think that's going to do it for this one. We've talked about what the magic need to do in in game three. Number one, just need to shoot the ball better. Need to try to cut down on some of these defensive lapses. If if the, you know, the ball's not going through the basket and you've got to find a way to, to get out to better starts and, and, uh, you know, try to, limit the second chance opportunities by Cleveland, but I don't have anything else unless you do. And if not, then we're on to game three. Yeah. Let's get some sleep. If you are going to be at Kia, please cheer your little heart out. Mm. Scream until your vocal cords rupture. (laughs) Just leave it all in the stands. Like if you're not tasting blood as you're (laughs) screaming in the second half of this game, I promise you, you are doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. They, Paolo Bancaro, he put the word out tonight. Yeah. They need us. Yep. Do not let them down Thursday night. And it, I have a feeling that if we don't let them down in terms of bringing the energy and, and and lifting them up, they will not let us down, and we will get a victory Thursday night. We need it. Let's do it. All right, folks, that is going to do it for this one. Uh, for Luke Sylvia, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You all have been listening to the Six Man Show, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sixth Man Show. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!